Good morning, family. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mary Beth. Wonderful. Um, welcome, uh, members of First Christian Church, disciples of Christ. Welcome to uh, our online visitors who will be uh, viewing this later and to visitors here assembled with us. Uh, happy Sunday to you all. Uh, First Christian Church is uh, an open and affirming church, our service, our fellowship, our membership, our invitation to this table later is open to all, and all means all. As disciples of Christ, we put our trust in God and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior through our confession that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We welcome and respect all forms of baptism. We believe in the integrity of each individual's relationship with God and allow for diversity of conviction and opinion. Every Christian should study the scripture and listen for the Holy Spirit as God communes with us at our unique point of need in the voice, tone, and timbre tuned to the wavelength of each of our own souls in our ever-fluctuating moments of need, angst, gratitude, and meditation. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so. And now, would you please join us for in uh, 337 in your hymnal, Jesus Calls Us or the Tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you all. Please be seated. 
Uh, announcements. Let's turn to the back of uh, the bulletin that uh, we have today. Coming up, uh, opportunities for uh, uh, service and participation uh, Monday. We're serving uh, at uh, Hope Campus. Ginger, are you here? Yep. There you are. Uh, it, raise your hand if anybody needs any information on serving at Hope Campus. Yes, sir? There you go. Okay. And then uh, DWF Group 4 is meeting on Tuesday. Lunch Bunch is meeting on Tuesday at uh, George's. Uh, the Ecumenical ben, uh, Men's Bible Study is on Wednesday morning. And then there are two opportunities for the new pastor's Bible study at 12 and 6 on Wednesday. Uh, Miss Betty, there you are, Crazy Crafters, meeting on Thursday. And then uh, uh, looking ahead, of course, next week is uh, Father's Day. There's going to be a uh, breakfast in the morning. And uh, John, did you want to say anything about that? Was that what we were talking about? The, uh, the father, yes. We got bacon. <laughs> Next Sunday, the youth and friends, dear friends of the youth, are going to come and prepare breakfast for the fathers of the church. Not only the fathers of the church, but we're going to open it up to everyone in the church because you ladies, like Trey said last, last Sunday, has got to come and keep us in line, okay? Menu, you know, is gonna be standard breakfast, biscuit, gravy, bacon, sausage, scrambled eggs, fruit. So next Sunday, please come, because it says somewhere in the Bible, I think Luke, that we're gonna, you know, kill the fatted calf, but next Sunday we're gonna kill the fatted pig, okay? So please come, please come and enjoy. With that, do we have any uh, <clears throat> concerns uh, within the fellowship, uh, uh, relatives or friends that need to be uh, brought onto our uh, lifted thought and prayer list? I just want to let everybody know that Linda Creekmore had her surgery Thursday. Um, she's really sore. Surgery took about six and a half hours. She's doing somewhat okay. She's still sore. She's going to be sore for a while. But just keep her in her prayers. Thank you. Thank you any, any more on that? What about celebrations? Anybody got birthdays, anniversaries, other things that uh, you need to say about somebody else? Uh, yes, sir. Randy will, Randy will celebrate his 17th. 17. 17th. 72. 72. 72. One. <laughs> Birthday on Tuesday. Some All righty. And what day is that, actually? Tuesday. Okay. All righty. All right. We'll see you at lunch. So then, okay. Anyone else? Okay. Brad has his own way of doing things, and we love him for it. Amen, amen. Good morning, beautiful people of God, and you are a beautiful group this morning. How do you feel? Good. You feel good? Feel like having church today? Since we're here, we might as well. To all our guests, if we have any, our visitors, we welcome you, First Christian. Uh, did I see Meredith back there, Floyd? Now, who's that sitting next to you? I thought that was Meredith coming in. I remember you. How you been? Didn't you just graduate? Well, congratulations, my friend. All right. <laughs> Beloved, I did speak with Linda last night, as Tim has indicated, and she is in 
quite a bit of pain, and her message to you is that she really loves her church. That's, those are her exact words. We want to keep her in prayer this morning. Her and Jim, they're up and down, as well as the Jacksons. We, we, we love them, and we want them to know that we do, and we do that by praying for them. Nick Oliver's granddaughter is in Mercy Medical Center. She's having surgery this week, and we would really uh, ask that you would pray for her. And I also ask that you would pray for Sabrina, who is traveling this morning to take our grandson to a summer camp in Hot Springs. So she should be just getting on the highway now, so we're praying that she make it there Drop him off, turn around, and come back. Get back home before dark, so keep her in prayer. That's about it, except thanking you all for the 33 of you who combined attended the noon and the 6 o'clock service. We had a ball. Uh, I know I did. And uh, I encourage you to come out uh, on Wednesdays. You don't have to attend every one of them because each one is a standalone class and we are talking about the orientation to the Bible. There would no longer be a sign up out in the North X because I just wanted to get an idea of how many people to uh, prepare for and you did an outstanding job. So we will start on time, we will end on time. Come with your Bible, bring your Bible and uh, we will be looking for you then. Now, let us go to our call to worship. If you would stand, please. And on the inside page of your bulletin. <clears throat> and then after that, remain standing for the invocational prayer, first with a moment of silence as we go into the prayer. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. I keep the Lord always before me. Because God is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Just as I am without one plea, but that <clears throat> thy blood <clears throat> was shed for me. And thou, thou biddest me to come to thee, O Lamb of God, O Lamb of God, O Lamb of God, we come. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, Lord and Savior, you are the Lamb, takes away the sins of the world. We come, we bring with us our faults and all our shortcomings, assured that you will forgive us of every one of them and still love us. Thank you for your mercy and your amazing grace. You've brought us from a mighty long way to where we are today. Jesus, we lay at your feet our prayer concerns and petitions on behalf of this waiting congregation and those who have charged us to pray for them. <clears throat> we call the names of the Jacksons, Creek Moors, Nick Oliver's granddaughter, Sabrina, and all those unspoken and all those names that have been mentioned in this service. Lord, have mercy on them all. We lift up in prayer our troubled country this morning amidst the division, the hatred, and misunderstanding 
that seems to be the order of the day. We call for unity and harmony, believing that it can only happen with prayer and divine intervention. Bless the members of this congregation and let love continue to grow in a way that Fort Smith will know that we are the people of God. We ask these things and more in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us that when we pray, say, Our Father. be seated. Our scripture reading today comes from page 798 in your pew Bible, and if history is any guide, we're going to get asked if we still have our Bibles open during the sermon. Just a heads up. So this is a uh, Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
Lord, bless and empower <clears throat> not only this word, but also this feeble preacher. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. amen. If anyone will come after me, <clears throat> let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. These are the words of Jesus. These words are an open invitation to become a Christian. The book of Acts is clear when it declares in chapter 11, verse 26, where it says, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. This observation was originally not intended to be a compliment, but rather a sarcastic criticism. The first century AD, when the church was in its infantile stages, just getting started, the followers of Jesus were so focused, so bent on being like Jesus, that others took notice. These men and women were so convinced, so convicted and committed to his teachings, to his preachings, and to his holy lifestyle that they wanted to imitate him and so they were labeled Christian or Christ imitators. They wanted to be like Jesus, the Son of God. I believe that the goal of every Christian, once we are saved, should be to be more and more like Jesus. There is a hymn, we sing it, whose words declare, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. And then it goes on to say, I want to be like Jesus. Then there's another hymn that declares, more about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. I might as well tell you that to be like Jesus is no easy matter. To be like him is more than a notion, and let me tell you why. Being like Jesus comes with a very high price tag. It will cost us something. Again, I hear him saying, if anyone Come after me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Jesus left little to no doubt that an invitation to join him on his earthly kingdom-building mission is in reality an invitation to suffer and die. I shared with you on a previous occasion, and this will keep coming up as time goes on, that in his book, Costly Discipleship, and I believe it's in our library, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, famous German theologian, wrote from a prison cell that when Jesus calls us to follow him, he writes, he is really inviting us to come die with him. But yet, these followers in Antioch, realizing what they had been called to, were still so committed to their faith in Jesus as the Son of God that they made a conscious decision 
to go after him anyway, no matter what it costs, to chase after his lifestyle. They decided to become God chasers. Since Jesus is the son of God and in every way he is God, then to go after him is to become a God chaser. Jesus came to seek and save, he tells us, until the tables are turned at Calvary and then we begin seeking after him. Ever since Calvary and the resurrection of Jesus, followers of Jesus have been going after him from earth to glory. There may be a few God chasers in the crowd today. I just believe that there are Christians in our midst every day who have sold out for the cause of Christ and they want to be like him. Are you one of them? And just in case you are not sure what a God chaser is, allow me a few minutes to explain. In the summer, around the year 2000, Tommy Tenney, a Pentecostal revivalist, authored a book called God Chasers, which is where the idea of this sermon came from. In the book, he says, God chasers is a person whose passion for God's presence presses them to chase the impossible in hopes that the uncatchable might catch them. Let, let, me, let me repeat that again. That kind of flows off of my tongue. People whose passion for God's presence presses them to chase the impossible in hopes that the uncatchable might catch them. That's what Paul meant over in Philippians 3.12 when he says, I follow after that that I may apprehend for which I am also apprehended of Christ. Paul is saying once Jesus came running after him and now Paul is running after Jesus. That means to be a God chaser is a spiritual marathon. You don't need Nikes. Please don't take this phrase to mean that God is running away from us as we pursue him. It simply means that it pleases God when his children come seeking him in spirit and in truth. The text found in Psalm 14, 2 declares, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. God is looking for those who would come after him to run with him. As sinful as we are, and don't be offended, the creator of the universe who is holy in all his ways, he loved us so much that he comes after us. That's what Bethlehem was about. That's what Christmas is about even after us in our sins, in hopes that we will repent or turn away from our sins, accept him as our personal Lord and Savior, and become his children. That is the God side of the chase. God first comes after us, but after we have been saved, after we have had an encounter with Jesus, after we have seen his face spiritually, and experienced his grace after we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, God then touches our souls and says, tag, you're it. It's on you. 
It is then that we go after him. We spend the rest of our lives chasing after the ways of his son Jesus to be like him. That's why we are called disciples. We are disciples of Christ. Even though I accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior at the age of 12, it was not until my early 20s that he really touched my life and said, tag. Now it's on you, he told me, and I have tried to catch him ever since. But Jesus wants us to follow him, not blindly, but in faith. But Jesus does not want us coming after him without knowing what we are getting into. He declares again, I keep saying this, if anyone comes after me, he says, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Jesus sets forth the prerequisites for going after him. The fir first thing he says is, if you are going to come after me, you must deny yourself. To, to be a God chaser, beloved, means you can't have the world and Jesus too. So many try. To go after Jesus means we must be willing to prioritize everything we value. To deny ourselves of what the world values most. The things that, we, that should mean the most to us, should mean the most, are our family, our friends, fortune and fame, and our faith. That's our value system. I call them the five Fs. Those are the things we live for, we work for, and perhaps are willing to die for, and not necessarily in that order. But here comes Jesus saying we must be willing to place faith in him in first place now. He calls us to give up anything and everything that comes before him. We must deny ourselves, and few of us can do that or even willing to do that. John said it like this in, in 1 John 2.15, Love not the world, neither the things of the world. For if any person loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. On more than one occasion, Jesus had to challenge a potential follower to check and evaluate their priorities. Over in Luke chapter 9, one man asked Jesus, if he could go bury his father before joining him. And this is what Jesus said. Let the dead bury the dead. And then in the same verse, another man asked Jesus, let me go home first to say goodbye to my family. Jesus said, no person having put their hands to the plow and looking back is fit for the king. And this may sound a little rough to some of us, but what Jesus is trying to get us to see is going after him requires immediate, total, and unconditional commitment, denial and sacrifice. Few of us can do that 100% even preachers struggle with it. Confession's good for the soul, folks. He's not telling us that family, friends, fortune, and fame have no value. What Jesus is saying is, don't let those things become distractions, preventing us from going after him. Then the next thing he says is, take up his cross. We're going to go after Jesus. It must be by way of the cross. There's no other way. We can only get close to Jesus by way of the cross. You will never get close to him without getting close to the cross. 
We will never get close to the cross without getting some of his blood on us. The cross is a place of suffering and no one willingly wants to suffer. No one in his right mind loves pain, misery, and heartache unless you happen to be a masochist. <laughs> But to go after God, the Son of God, there is no way to be like him without experiencing some crosses in your life. Thank God for our crosses. Paul said it like this in Philippians, by way of the cross that I may know him, I want to know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. I want to know all those things, being made conformable unto his death. That means that the more we identify with righteous suffering of Jesus, the more we become like Jesus and are willing to suffer for the faith ourselves. Jesus was the most innocent person who ever lived, who died the most horrible death ever recorded. Paul in this verse says that by way of the cross, there is power that comes to us after we have come through our crosses and arrive on the other side of our resurrections. The cross is our earthly transportation that takes us from our way to his way. Notice he says, Take up your cross. Every child of God has a cross to bear. And no two crosses are identical and no two Christians carry the exact, exact same kind of cross. The songwriter said it best when he asked the question, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? There's a cross for everyone, and there is a cross for me. We all have our crosses to bear, but always remember that no matter how heavy our cross, how bloody or painful, God will never put more on us than we can bear. Sometimes we question that, but it's the truth. He will allow crosses to come our way but then, here's the last thing Jesus says. After all that, follow me. To be a God chaser means that we must, be, must not be distracted. We must keep our eyes on him. No cross, no crime. To be a God chaser means that we must keep our eyes on the prize. On this Christian journey, it's so easy to get distracted by sidebars. We're living in an age where there are so many things vying for our attention, and Jesus seems to be in competition with all of these other distractions. Even Christians are being tossed to and fro by all the things that come at us and have allowed our attention to be directed off of Jesus. We cannot chase Jesus without keeping our eyes on the prize. We have taken our eyes off Jesus, and while we were not paying attention, somebody snuck in and took prayer out of school. We took our eyes off of Jesus and drugs found their way into almost every neighborhood in America and have taken over. Nothing good can happen when you lose sight of Jesus. Just ask Peter, who almost drowned, when he was allowed to walk out of, come out of the boat, walk on water, looking at Jesus until he took his eyes off of Jesus and he sank. Jesus is the prize, folks. He is the high calling. It's only when we go after him that we have the peace that passes all understanding. 
It's only when we go after him in the midnight hour that joy will eventually show up in the morning. It's only when we go after him that we can stand in the midst of this division and fragmentation and still be able to say, it's well with my soul, because God's got this. It's only when we go after him that the church will be the church. That's a good sermon title. He's calling us to be in these last and evil times to be his people. And it starts at Calvary. It starts at the cross. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away, it was there by faith I received my sight. And now, now, I am happy all the day. God chases.
Communion is central to our worship experience and we invite all Christians to participate in our celebration of the Lord's Supper together. Regarding the table as Christ's and not our own, we bar no one from this table. Everyone, whether you are members of this church, another church, or no church at all, is welcome to partake. We set the table as Jesus charged, offer the invitation, and serve the elements of grace so that all may receive them. We believe in the power of this simple meal with our Lord and share it in every Sunday. Hear now our words of institution. And when you come forward, please come through the outside aisles and return through the center aisles. If you need somebody to bring it to you, uh, a deacon will do so. Sir. From 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26, words of institution. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us come.
In this sacred moment of communion, let us gather our hearts and minds in unity and reverence as we partook of this bread and wine, symbols of the body and blood of our Savior. We were reminded of the profound love that surrounds us. Let this communion be a, re a testament of our shared journey of faith, binding us together as one community, one family, one body in Christ. May these elements nourish not only our bodies, but also our souls, filling us with grace, forgiveness, and the strength to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Pray with me, please. Precious God, as we come before you in this act of remembrance and thanksgiving, we humbly acknowledge our dependence on your sustaining presence. Bless this communion table sanctified by your love and grant us the wisdom to discern your will in our lives. May this sacred meal be a source of renewal and transformation, empowering us to go forth into the world as bearers of your light and agents of your peace. In communion with one another and with you, may we embody the love that transcends all boundaries and unites us in the divine embrace. Amen. As we remain standing, I am authorized and pleased and proud to extend the invitation to discipleship to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You heard him already say that if anyone comes after him, let them deny themselves, pick up the cross and follow. If there are any here today, please make known your requests to either unite with us as a member or to accept Jesus Christ and to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Page 354, Seek Ye First. Seated. I just happen to know that we have
gladly welcome you to this community of faith, enfolding you with our love and committing ourselves to your care. In the power of our spirit, let us mutually encourage each other to trust God and strengthen one another to serve others, that Christ's church may in all things stand faithful. and remain standing until the acolytes have come. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, let us all say amen. amen.